Just remember, everybody, there's a lot of money about to be sloshed around. Welcome to today's live stream. So, of course, as you have uh, already guessed, the market is quite green. And the question is, why exactly is that? It's very simple. Rate cuts. So tomorrow we will see what Jerome Powell and the crew over at the Fed Reserve are wanting to do. But it looks like, and this is quite uh, interesting, I was under the impression we'd be getting 25 basis point cuts. But if we take a look at the Fed Watch tool, it looks like uh, we're leaning towards, again, 50 basis point cuts. Right now, the current rate tar target rate is 525 to 550. If we get 50, 50 basis points, we're going from 475 to 500. That's quite a high one. This is what the market expects, but that doesn't mean that it is 100% accurate. And I will just remind you, this was a post just uh, came off a couple hours ago. BlackRock, you know those guys, so many trillions of assets under management said that the Federal Reserve's interest rate cuts will not be as deep as the market expects. Now, we've had Elizabeth Warren come out and said that she expects and wants 75 basis point cuts. The market itself says 50, and now we've got BlackRock saying 25, for essentially. I don't know which one it's real, but I can tell you what happened with the market today. Nice green day. And this is part of the reason. So there's a natural exuberance. Does anybody really know where we're going here as far as the market? Nobody really knows. But that's why it is a speculative asset market. And we've just seen in 24 hours, 5.6%. Over seven days, we went up 7%. And you know this because you've taken a look at your portfolio already probably 10 times this morning. So as we can see across the board, we have got uh, quite a bit of an upswing. And it's looking uh, quite spicy, quite nice. And SWE, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, SWE, layer one blockchain, is up 26% for the week. We'll talk about why that is. But for the Fed... Uh, rate cuts. I'm going to encourage everybody to come over to my friend uh, Tom Crown's channel. There is a link in the description. We'll all watch that live together. He does a great job of explaining what exactly is going on as it happens. So we'll go over there uh, tomorrow. Looks like uh, scheduled for September 18th. And uh, we'll see exactly what Jerome Powell says. But the question you probably have is, what does this mean for us and the markets in general? So just as a little recourse, a little refresher, in the, in the short term, probably good. In the long term, historically, not so much. And I put this together, it's probably like the third or fourth time we've actually talked about this. And legitimate concerns like, look, if we're in a recession next year, it's some trad 6166, no way the four-year cycles will be of any significance. It might discourage, prevent people from investing in crypto next year. Then we got to wait, <laughs> and he's, he might be right, eight years for a bull market, anywhere close to last. Crypto would die. And as I We've talked about this many times. We take a look at historically, going uh, all the way back into the 1950s into the latest one, which was uh, February 2020 and April 2020. Historically speaking, uh, recessions last 10 months. And uh, if we think about it, the actual recession, if, we, if you want to separate uh, the markets and the economy, because they're two separate things, the, econ the economy actually bounces back last and the markets bounce back first. So let's just take a look historically about where we've been. Now we're gonna, let's take a look at the 1990s. And if you can see, let me make sure you can see this quite as well as you possibly can. And we'll, take, we'll, we'll zoom in in a bit. But during the first rate cut over here, we can see that the market actually did pretty well. It was a little plateau, cuts, 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 cuts. And then we had a, we had a plateau right here again, and then we cut, and that's when we hit a recession. So this was like a double top almost. And you can see that during this time, during the rate cuts, this is from May 89 to July, August or so, when the market was doing pretty darn well, even though it was a little dip. What does that mean? Well, it means going forward, we could see the exact same thing again. So initially, we could see a nice pump to the market, which is, I think, why everybody's excited right here, because what happens to the market? Money starts getting printed, quantitative easing, all that great stuff. But remember, there is a price to pay for all that printing of money. You just saw that video in the very intro. There is recourse. And the Fed is not going to allow that much circulating supply of cash out forever. They'll cut at some point, And we'll have a little bit of inflation. And then we'll go back and forth. Let's move forward. 2000. And we can see here that we had a little bit of a plateau. And here's the uh, S&P 500 in blue. In red are the rates the Fed rates themselves. 
And we can see we raised rates, raised rates, raised rates. Everything's going good. We missed it as it came down. There was a cut, then another cut, and the market dropped out. But then look how fast it recovered initially. It took about a month and it did a, like a, a little bit of a pump. And then it realized, oh, wait, I'm still in a recession. And then down it went. But what you may notice is the recession kept going forward, but the market rebounded within six months from the topish to the bottom, six months and then two months. So to talk about, well, are the four year cycle still intact? It still could be, but how about the great recession? And the great recession was one of those things we should actually take a, a hard look at because I don't think that the next recession is going to be very soft. I think it's gonna be very severe for all the money printing that we've done. And we can see that initially rates get cut, market rallies, market's doing fine, a little bit of a, of a dip, starts to rally again. And then when they figure it out, that if wait, 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 things aren't as good as we think it is, then they start to cut massively. And this is what the market does. And you can see even in like a recession, and I don't know if you guys were around, I'm sure we all were around at this point, but during the you know 2007, 2009, almost 2010 recession, it was brutal. And you can see that even in that time, the market, the markets rallied, but the economy was sucking and it was not sustainable. And then it just dropped off the face of the planet. And it took 15 months from the rate cuts or the recession themselves to the bottom. Now the economy took another three months to recover, but you notice the markets recovered first. And then I'll throw this in because this is like the best case scenario. This is of course during the uh, Cerveza sickness virus. And we can see that it took like a month and then it rebounded in like another month and not a big deal. But why was that? It's because the Fed, or excuse me, the Treasury printed cash like it was going out of style. And that would be the M2 money supply. So that's just four or five points or so. I want to really bring this home and talk about when in doubt, zoom out. Because people would say, well, that just means, okay, it's going to be an initial little pump for the market and then it's going to drop off because that's what we're saying. Not really. If we go all the way back into the 1984, look at this. I want to show you something to the next recession. This is 83 going into the 90s. What do you notice? Rates are here. They dropped off. This is during 1979, 1980, Volcker days. They started to raise rates, plateaued. Market didn't like that. Raised rates, raised rates. And now here, you'll notice that once they started to cut rates, because it was a healthy economy, ish. Once they started to cut the rates, what happened to the S&P 500 and the markets? They started to really rally. And they cut rates, a little bit of a plateau here, market didn't like that too much, and then just kept going. So just because this happened before doesn't mean it's going to happen again. Again, for this one, I think what will happen is we'll have a natural exuberance. We'll go forward, but at some point we have to pay the piper and a recession at some point is in our future. But it's just something to take a look at. I don't want anybody to get over their skis and get a little bit too crazy. Let me know what you think about in the comments section. And now some good news. Circle, and this was the, the answer to the question, which was why was there such a big jump with SWE blockchain? Well, this is why. So CircleTap SWE blockchain for a wider USDC integration. USDC is a, is a pretty good stable coin. I still think that Tether owns the lion's share. I wanna say 74 to 76% of all stable coin transactions are on Tether. Correct me in the comment section, but USDC is trying to make, a, make waves. And what they want to do is they want to increase their liquidity. So what do they do? They tap. Sweet. September 17th post, Evan Chang, co-founder and CEO of Mistin Labs, revealed that his firm's blockchain, Sui, has partnered with Circle to bring USDC to the network. Chang did not provide additional information. However, market observers know that the move would boost liquidity in Sui's fast-rising ecosystem. And I got to tell you, TPS is pretty good. And further attract more users to the network. And this is the interesting part here. Launched in 2023. I had no idea Sweet was that young. I thought that they were a little bit older. So I had to take a look back. I'm like, well, how is the price doing? We know that we just taught, we saw it almost 11% in the last 24 hours. How are we doing in seven days? All right, not too bad. About a month? Eh. How about three months? Sideways like everything else. How about a year? Well, we can see that 
back in March, when we had that nice little rally because of the Bitcoin ETF and everything else followed, it was at $2. Now, if we max out, the all-time high, funny enough, was this year. And it was six months ago. That's pretty amazing. So maybe SWE could be one of those that you add to your portfolio. I own a little bit of SWE, very little, but I think it's something to actually consider as it moves into those categories. And the question that I had from people, which was like, well, who cares about stable coins? What does that do for me? What am I gonna invest in the dollars? No. The thing with stable coins is you wanna look at which stable coins are building on which layer one blockchains. And I gotta give you a hint. Ethereum is running away with it. Solana is also being used quite extensively, especially on PayPal. PayPal picked two. They picked Ethereum and they picked Solana. So if you're looking at like, well, which one, which layer one, which layer? take a look at all the stable coins that are out there. You can also take a look at Tron. I know people laugh at Tron, but there's a reason why it stayed in the top 15 for quite so long. And I think it's because of those stable coins. And then also you might wanna take a look at SWE. You might also wanna take a look at Polygon and a host of others. But that, my friends, I think is something to consider, not financial advice, go from there. And then uh, as just a real quick note, I like what Dan said here. This is Dan Gambardello, got a great uh, YouTube and uh, channel over on Twitter, or the kids call it X now. But uh, he says, hey, this headline is something that Cardano needs. Too bad it hasn't happened yet. And there was, I remember there was a big discussion about bringing stable coin. Well, there is a stable coin on there already. I, I, I will correct myself. But to bring USDC onto Cardano. And for some reason they shot it down. And I think it was because they said, well, there's, there is additional costs and it's millions of dollars to, to bring on a stable coin. And, and we don't want to do that because we want to have our own. But I got to tell you, as time goes on, I think it's partnerships like that, which will grow an ecosystem. And uh, I'm here, I'm behind Dan on this one. I think they should have at least tried to implement a little bit more, use this USDC stable coin because it's more liquidity, just like we took a look at. But you know, maybe I'm off. Correct me in the comment section. Tell me what you think of that. And then lastly, justice might be served. Alex Mashinsky. We all remember him. He's been on the channel like three or four times. Remember that? And he came in here and lied to everybody's faces and said that Celsius was great and it was fantastic and he hoodwinked us all, me included. <sighs> well, now he's going to face 115 years in prison. Former CEO Alex Mashinsky did not mean to harm anyone, his lawyer said in a memorandum filed on Friday. Well, he did. Mashinsky's lawyers asked the New York District Court to allow for witnesses ranging from the crypto leader's chief financial officer to chief revenue officer to testify in his criminal trial. And that's great. There has to be due process. We are in America still. But as a reminder, uh, the lawyer stated this, this is for Alex's, Mashinsky's lawyers. They, they say the stakes are high. The government has informed the defense that its current position is that the sentencing guidelines calls for Mr. Mashinsky to receive a sentence of 115 years in prison. And I got to tell you, couldn't happen to a better person. And that's it for today. Look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing when we talk about his time sensitive.